Okay, without a much further ado, we're going to get Brian Caldersmith up. Brian was around in the very early days, took a lot of photographs and the likes of when the circuit was being laid out. Uh, so he's going to tell us about uh, what things were like then. He has a, quite a number of photographs he's going to show. So I would welcome up here Brian Caldersmith. Thank you. Getting down to the easy part. Yeah. Take those glasses out of the way. Sure. Can I hear it? Yep. Thank you, Brian. Evening, one and all. Uh, yes, I've been given the job of kicking off tonight. Uh, and I'll be talking about the early days. Uh, I think it's important straight away. The dates there showing 12th of March 67 and 23rd of August uh, were in fact just the race meetings on the circuit that we all know. Emirate Park had been going on for a, a lot longer uh, than that and had been around well beforehand. Uh, the, the circuit we're all fairly familiar with and this is where it all began. This is the front cover of what was effectively the prospectus for Amaru Park, which was started by uh, Oscar Glasser, who some of you here will remember. Oscar owned 250 acres at uh, Allen Grove, and he also owned uh, North City Traders, which was probably the first of the uh, hire, equipment hire companies. But Oscar was hiring not just chainsaws, he was hiring D9s and all sorts of uh, fairly heavy earth moving equipment, which made it fairly easy for him to shuffle around uh, his 250 acres and, and play with circuit designs and things. To give you a feel, um, long before the circuit started, the hill climbs were running, the, the dirt circuit was running, there was a, a scrambles meeting there in 1962 um, and another one in 63 on an oil dirt. So our circuit came along a lot later. And this is probably where we should quote Macbeth uh, or uh, to sleep perchance to dream. And this was one of the real dreams. Um, when you look at some of the things that they were talking about happening, like swimming pools, tennis courts, bowling greens, club rooms, licensed stuff, uh, picnic areas, restaurants, ballrooms, outside and inside, children's play area. This went on and on, listing all sorts of this wonderful stuff, where it all was, how to get there and how to join because there are in fact three clubs there was the um, combined Amaru Combined Sporting Club Limited the Amaru Country Amaru Country Sporting Club and the Amaru Park Proprietary Limited which actually leased to those other clubs now the plan was like this you can see there's all sorts of circuits. This never happened. That never happened. That never happened. The hill climb worked. And the dirt circuit worked. What we ended up with was a circuit as a bit of a, com a combination of them. Like that. And I'll show you in a moment the actual surveyor's drawing of the circuit that we all know about. Now, when you join, you pay 25 pounds as a debenture holder, and that got you a return supposedly of 8% a year, which paid for your membership renewal each year. 
And the idea was that those members with their £25 debenture would help build this clubhouse. And when you paid your money, you got a letter like that. And some of you here would also know the name of uh, the bottom there, Jeff Brakel. Because a great deal of the early members of this were all from the North Shore Sporting Car Club. But some of the things I like in here are uh, talking about coming along, bringing friends to support the club, because they have supper dances. Uh, if I can find it, the dress tie or cravat. is uh, tie or cravat, which I think is <laughs> very reminiscent of, of the era. Now, a lot of the early debenture holders, you know, was John Crouch and David Mackay, Tommy Solomon, and uh, Mr. Brunninghausen, who I think is with us tonight. Yes, there's another dementia holder. Um, and the one I really like, Mrs. Jack Myers, which I thought was nice, because Jack had, had passed away by then. And when you joined, you paid your money, you got your little club badge, which looked like that, the Emory Country Sporting Club. And that had your member number on the back of it. Now, I said we'd look at the circuit according to the surveyor, and it looked like this. Now, you can't read down the bottom, but for the pedantic people amongst you, you would be in interested to know that the length of the circuit was 6,386 feet 5 inches. <laughs> I assume it was measured in the middle of the track all the way around. I don't know how surveyors work those sort of things out. The other interesting thing is that it has all the original corner names on it, which were used in all the programs for the first few years. Box Hill Corner, Nelson Corner, Cat Eye Curve, Cat -Eye Curve the, the Crest, Sunset Strait. Now, <laughs> later on, of course, they all changed as advertising came in and whoever was paying the money charged the, changed the name to suit. Now, one of the things I'm glad I did, before we put the bitumen down, I walked around the circuit and took some photographs. Now this is pit straight, as it says, looking up the kink and up to the hill, and right about there is where the tower ended up. This is further up the hill, as you, as you come up the hill, looking back down across you can see round from the cutting down to the, there's the, the, the lake. That's looking down, this is after the loop, looking down towards the cutting. And you can see why it was called the cutting from this next shot. If I can find the right. And that was a fav favourite spot for photographers to stand on the top of that and get, catch the guys they came round the corner down into the, into the cutting. Looking now, the cutting towards what we ended up calling Stop Go, uh, with a lake on the right. There's, you can see back towards the cutting, down into Stop Go, and here's, you can see the speedway circuit they built. And the lake, the lake was beautiful. Um, looking back towards the main straight again, now, I used to go swimming there and, and other people because in the middle of the lake there was this lovely pontoon with a walkway out to it and we used to go out there on the weekends and swim in the lake. It was lovely. The other thing I used to do too is, was as part of all the development here, uh, tennis courts and things that never happened, the other thing that never happened was the rifle range. And on a couple of occasions I took my rifle up there and blazed away on the supposed rifle range that was up there. 
Now, the very first meeting on our circuit, as we'll call it, was actually a bike meeting. It was on the 26th of February. And that was sort of, if you like, the, the tester. Following that, there was the first of the car meetings, which was in March, the following month. Now, it's not fair to say it was a Coolersmith benefit because if you look over there, you'll see three or four Coolersmiths there in the organising committee. But more importantly than that, here's the program from event one, time to start at 10.30, and I draw your attention to car 46. Mr. P. Moore, not a major, was in the very, very first race at the circuit. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Peter later. Following that was the first open meeting. And as part of that stuff there, we developed, a, I guess, the operation manual. This was the start of the operation manual. Uh, this is the bit for uh, the grid marshals, what to do, and there's some names there, and I think I see, dummy yeah. grid, Ron Hay. You remember that, Ron? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so th this was our, our first attempt then at, at an operational manual. Now, we mentioned that there are other things going on before the circuit, and this is what they were. The short circuit, the, 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 the dirt circuit, and this was the start, which was at a, a downhill run onto the, the dirt circuit. Uh, somebody building a mini around it. And a Jensen, of all things. And, yeah, is that, that's not yours, Knox, is it? No. <laughs> Okay, uh, and the hill climb. The hill climb was very popular and it had also been running long before our circuit got going. I think that's uh, Des Leonard and a well known Milano. And this is the one I like Stan Rumble in the Jindavik, that scary twin engine, frightening. The entire car, other than the rubber tyres, had been painted with silver frost. <laughs> Now, also at that time, other people uh, were running meetings there because the, the original club, the Emory Country Sporting Club Limited, lost the use of the circuit after several years because the money wasn't coming in and Oscar had lost patience and in fact the circuit was closed for a fair bit of 68, I think. Uh, and Oscar went looking for another operator to try and achieve his dream. So other people were running meetings there too, uh, the ARDC, because they had lost Warwick Farm. Um, now, after, and, and John Lackey's going to talk about the start of the historic meeting down there, but. Uh, the HSRCA got involved too, and we had a lot of meetings, and I could see a Will Hagen at the top of the ladder there with a, with a world champion. I can see, uh, actually it's a bit sad to look at the people that are no longer with us. Uh, there's another one. Paul Cross is not here tonight, but uh, Matt Carroll, Dick Willis. And we did have some terrific cars that used to turn up to the meetings. Um, times have sure changed. Bruce is not here tonight, is he? No. no pretty. And who remembers? Who remembers that? Yeah. Yeah, Barry Firth, but it's also, there's Graham Howard, um, 
that's Andrew Oswood. That's my brother, uh, Owen Willeman. Uh, oh, magnificent, sylph-like person standing there. Now, just to remind you of the raffle. Oh, sorry, that's the the day session we had there at the end of the. I think it was a five-day gathering that Frank Gardner put on for us as a as a driver training car preparation session. Remember that? It was good stuff. I was in the. In the Final day was a day at Amaru where Frank put us all through the. the uh, now, that's what I meant to show you. That's the book that is in the raffle. And Max Stahl, in fact, has sent his best wishes for us tonight. Uh, he's now living up in Queensland. But we used to have some good close racing, lots of fun. And some of the other people that ran meetings here weren't, uh, yeah, Mal Biddlecombe, some other twit inside him. Um, some of the other uh, people running meetings there weren't as careful as we were. Now, the other thing we've been able to do, thanks to, where is he, is put together some before and after photographs so as you can realise just how much it has changed. And the only way you can tell you're standing in the same spot is by lining up the trees because none of these roads were used. This road on the new estate is, has nothing to do with that road at all. Likewise here, it's only through the trees that you can see that you're in the same spot. The, the, this part has, has gone totally and that's a whole new road gone in. Same again there. Just no resemblance. In fact, it's spooky to go out there and you just can't see where you are. Before and after. Up in the terraces, even. Now, what I did was uh, overlay the circuit on a Google map just to give you a feel for what's happening. I do have some concerns for these people down here. Of course, you may remember we had a meeting cancelled because it's a floodplain and the rain was actually, the, the, rain, the, the water level was above the arm car. So uh, I would be seriously worried if I was living here at the moment. That was the last meeting. And there's a few of us here that were also at that last meeting, as was Peter Moore. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Gravity takes hold. Thank you, Brian. That was most informative. We're grateful that you were uh, uh, on the ball enough to take all those photos back in the early days to show what it was like. Uh, and it's all good stuff. Of uh, talking of the aforementioned Peter Moore, I'd like to welcome Peter up here. Peter's come from Las Vegas just to be with us tonight, so uh, I'd like to give a good welcome to Peter. Come on. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for troubling to come here. For the welcome. Thank you to the club for inviting me down to, to join this celebration. It's great to see so many, uh, you know, familiar faces again. It's been uh, been too long. But um, 
Amaru, Amaru was something that's very close to my heart. Um, because I actually started earlier than what Brian was talking. I, uh, <clears throat> the last few years of high school, I lived in Galston, and um, I used to cycle over to see what this thing was being developed over at, you know, at what turned out to be Amaru Park, and had no idea what it was. Um, but looking back on it, the scary thing is that I realised that was probably 1958. Do you know how many, how long ago they that? 60 freaking years. <laughs> oh, I thought, holy hell. But anyway, it was all, all good fun um, while it was uh, coming along. But, um, so I'll just run through some of the, I've dug out some old photos and... cycle over him and as I say it was um, yeah, 1958 my, my father had met um, what's it? Oscar Glasser. O Oscar Glasser and uh, was fascinated because it was I mean it was just a fascinating venture I mean I don't think anything like that had ever been considered uh, for a motor racing track I mean you can compare it to say Mount Druitt or uh, even Parramatta Park it was um, yeah we were talking about wow what, what, a, what an operation um, I'm going to need my glasses now. This is the worst part. So, his vision, as Brian ran through, was quite amazing. To include all of those different uh, facets of <coughs> facets of the, you know, the sport, everything down to the what didn't happen, the club, but you know, having the dirt circuits and the speedway track and the um, the trials area and all things like that. And um, also the, the development allowed for development of businesses on the site as well to support the whole operation. That was exciting in itself. But, um, but I, before the circuit got going, I went to one of the early hill climbs and I had a little Sprite and it, it, geez, it was hot. It had four inch wheels on it. They were, geez, they were so wide. And I got the class record. But, the only thing was, the next hill climb, Colin Bond was there in his sprite, and I think he beat my time by about three seconds. That's in, in 30. It was pretty, pretty telling where Bondy was. Um, but so we went on. Eventually, the March the 12th meeting came along, and as Brian spoke, it was, um, it was you know, that was the first car meeting, although I didn't realise there'd been a bike meeting before that. Yeah. So, um, no in the wrong order here somewhere but um, it was the first meeting was actually a closed invitation event it wasn't a wasn't a <coughs> pardon me it wasn't an open meeting it was um, the clubs invited were AARC which was Warwick Farm of course ARDC which was at that stage uh, what Catalina and Bathurst and New South Wales Road Racing Club which is Orange Park so it was the clubs that actually ran ran race meetings around the um, around the state, so um, there were less than 50 starters, it was a very quiet meeting, but as Max Tal and his report went, it was a well-run meeting, and Bruce Lear and the Milano was the star, so it, uh, it was very, you know, typical Max um, description. I ran the Nota Major, um, that's a car now that's owned by Dick, Dick Willis, Oh. 
Yeah. There must be a whole bunch under each picture. This, this, the whole show is on one. Anyway, that, that's um, that's to be. But I think the um, main thing was it was it was just a good, fun, low key, low key meeting. Pretty exciting um, for us to run on that track. One thing with Amaru was um, when you compare it to today's in, environment, the safety wasn't uh, exactly the highest priority. You saw some of those, <coughs> those photos with all the, the dirt banks, the concrete, um, rock walls, there were, there were little runoff areas and Brian was polite enough to call it a, a lake. It was actually a bloody dam, it wasn't a... <laughs> but, um, yeah, there was not everybody's cup of tea. Some people never liked it, other people liked it. It was one of those tracks that people, you know, you re if you got in the groove, it was terrific, and I was lucky enough to, um, you know, to, to be one of those people who I really liked it. But um, also the other different aspect in, you know, around this time was it wasn't only that we had Amaru Park, we had, you know, the competition for a circuit was uh, Warwick Farm, Oran Park, there was Bathurst, of which we all used to get a run at, Toac in Orange, and then later Eastern Creek. So there was so much competition, it was, um, it was quite different to um, today's environment. Um, similarly, the cars, no, yeah, I, there's a photo there somewhere, but um, the cars, as it was, so it shall be. You know, it's always what we put forward about historics. When you look at the cars, so the photo I had there, um, in terms of talking safety, um, you know, there was there was no no cutout switch. You know, the, the car that I got the photo of, my my car, the, a little a little half rollover bar. Um, there was, you know, I was wearing an open helmet, a short sleeve t-shirt, um, no gloves, no balaclava. And I think I had a lap belt, and I was probably driving in shorts. So it was a <laughs> very different world, yeah. On the other, the downside of that, I mean, over the years, there were a number of people had serious accident and accidents there, and uh, sadly, two of our club members, uh, John Allison and Ken Rowe, were, were killed at Amaru in, in that period. And, um, there were certainly a, a lot of other people that um, were, were injured. Um, it, it was a, oh, okay. It was a great social circuit. We can use that one. It was a great social circuit. There was a lot of friendship. The, as you could see, the pit area wasn't very, very large. Everybody was in together. I mean, it was a dirt base. There was no, I think later on there might have been some carports put up, I think, to give a bit of shade, but it was basically open. Um, but you, um, yeah, you took your, you, we didn't have such things as pop-ups then, what we used beach umbrellas and whatever you could find to get a bit of shade because one thing about Amaru, particularly with the historic meeting, because they were traditionally run at the um, over the Australia Day weekends. I mean who can remember how hot it was up there boy. It was and every year we'd say it's never again, but next year we'd all be back and, and that'd be because the other asset was in historics. There were typically only one historic meeting in each state at that stage. You know, there was one, one for us, one in Queensland, and one in Victoria, or maybe two in Victoria. They might have got two in Sandown and uh, Winton, and one in Adelaide. So a lot, of, did a lot of travelling to, to actually go and race your car. Um, but we loved it. It was all good fun and and that. I mean, Amaru was also one of the scene of one of my um, better better car deals. I'd, I'd sold the Nota Major when back in I think, say 1971 or 72, when uh, you know the usual thing of kids and all those things come along and that, and I sold it for six hundred dollars. Then in about 1980, I came. I'd been working overseas and came back. Foolishly, the week before Amaru and went there. By the end of the day, I'd bought the Nota Major back for six thousand, and, <laughs> and somebody had, there was a Chinese deal arranged with um, T 
Terry Harris, he had a Lynx, that I, an old Lynx that I had stashed away. He, he bought that, and I just had to fork over 6000 to get the car back that I'd sold for 600 so That's a good deal. But um, the, we had a great range of cars. That's one of the things, I, some of those photos there, I was just talking, you mentioned Graham Howard there. In the uh, uh, there's a photo there of the Lotus Six. That, um, I don't know if Graham drove that, but the Savicat was there. But there's a photo of uh, Dick Willis Cooper. Um, was the last one. Um, uh, anyway, but the, the range of cars was terrific. One of the photos I did see where there was um, back with the credit there was the Lago Talbot. Um, Peter Giddings. I mean. Yeah. 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 Oh, and that's my that's the Nedlo I had I stage. But the Peter Giddings and sometimes you bring the Maserati two fifty F. I mean imagine punting a car like that around Amarillo. I mean, it was, and he used to drive the, drive the wheels off it and uh, it was and he loved he loved coming to Amarillo. He loved the loved the atmosphere, the, the way it all, all went together. Um, the, from the HSRCA perspective, we were one of the clubs that took it over. I think also MG Car Club ran it for a while, didn't they? But then, then we took over and um, we had some great meetings. Not only race meetings, we had some, um, uh, some uh, family days, fun days, all sorts of things at, at um, Amaru. And um, with the last family, or was the first family day that I can um, recall. I, I organised or ran ran that, and I thought that was that was a, f a fun day. Everybody enjoyed it. I think we we paid something like five dollars for a car, and if you had a if you had a passenger, it was another five dollars, and um, that was good until the ADC realised what they'd let themselves in for with everybody hanging around with the passengers in the car, <laughs> and um, there were two two aspects of this which was. Um, Unusual one was there was a, a racer uh, called uh, Bill Marshall. You, some of you might remember remember Bill. Or, sadly, Bill is not no longer with us. But um, he came up when the ADC put the clamp on the um, on the uh, having passengers, and he'd already had one run around in his Ferrari with his son, with his you know about six or seven year old in his drive. The, Kid was in a driving suit and the whole bit and he organised it. Anyway, when we told no more passengers, Bill came up and he wanted his five dollars back because he'd only got one <laughs> one run for the day. The other aspect was that we had a club member known as Mori Noitaga. Some of you might remember. Yeah. Ah, oh, good. Yep. Oh, that was a lot of fun in those days. But I remember everybody. Um, you you'd been you were late and had missed the drivers' meeting, and the drivers' meeting said there was no um, you know to be no overtaking under brakes or on corners or whatever. And, and Murray came and he was late and he's out turning around, doing all this, and everyone said, "What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do?" Murray had a bit of a reputation, as you might know, but um, I said, "We've got to call him in and tell him." Called him in and everybody's staring around watching what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And spoke to Murray and he just apologised, he didn't realise, gentle as a lamb. And everybody goes, oh, phew, thank goodness. You know? <laughs> it was just such a, a, such a great relief because I think everybody respected what we were there for. It was just for fun and we all had a, we all had a wonderful time. The, um, that photo that you saw before, that was Ron Reed, who was one of our most popular members back in those days. It is the Solomon Singer, and I think that was probably his 70th birthday. Of the um, uh, sitting with the family with his grandkids in the in the pits with his um, um, John Medley, who looks a little bit older now, don't you? Some of <laughs> but um, no, it was a great place. The the other picture there that did come up was the um, the Ferrari. Yeah, the next one. That one. That one there. We 
at one of our meetings, uh, we organised for the whole group of para, Olympic, uh, para athletes to, to come out, and the bus came out, and they all embarrassed us all by running their wheelchairs around the track. Imagine pushing a wheelchair up, and they did laps of this and that. And um, anyway, that, when that was all done, they were, they were great people. And uh, I think I was in one of the next events. And I went out, and as I, when I came for that event, when I came in, I was called up to the um, uh, to the tower and got up there. And I said, "What have I done wrong?" You know the usual thing. And uh, got that, and they said, "No, get your helmet." Uh, the helmet. I thought they're going to send me home. Anyway, I went down, and uh, Spencer Martin had come out for the for the day in. Um, it, gee, uh, in, it, that was the first F40, I think it was F40 in Australia. That was um, Man Kerry Manolis at the at the time, I think. Anyway, Spencer, then, or what they'd organised, for Spencer to take me for, half, take me for half a dozen laps with him around the track in the F40 Ferrari, which was obviously you know, an amazing buzz. And we can't, I had a friend who wasn't a car racing person, but he was a photographer and a car enthusiast, and he'd come out. He came out while we're going around in the, in the Ferrari. And when the Ferrari came in, we stopped right next to where, where he was watching and clicking away with his photograph, with his camera. I got out of the car, pulled off my helmet, and my friend just about fell through the floor, and he said, you, you're driving that, you're driving that, you're driving that. Yeah, he hadn't realised it was a left-hand drive car and I was just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was so funny. Okay, but then uh, Amaru then became, sorry, Amaru, when I said about the businesses, there were some, some great people who worked out in those uh, support business, people like Robbie Rowe, Bob Winley, um, Bob Britton was out there, Harry Galloway. Bob Britton here tonight? Yeah, sorry, I haven't seen him tonight. Yeah, Bob's here. Yeah, hi Bob. Yeah, all sorts of people. And it was, I mean, it was just a place. Can we get the speaker in? We, oh, sorry. So I think it was just a place like we'd never experienced before, and I don't think it'd been repeated really now any, anywhere else. Yeah. That, um, the, the atmosphere was great, people oh, loved it. And, um, oh, okay. It was great. And I guess then we click on to where do we go? The, la the last meeting. Can we get the. We, we came to the last meeting. Yeah. Yep. We should have the grid. The grid mentioned there somewhere. Yeah. About 27, I think. Now uh, that's that's the program. That's the cover for the program. There we go. Now I won't run through them all, but there's quite a number of people that I can so I've seen tonight that were running in that race. Um, Tony Simmons, Brian Callersmith, uh, Bruce Mansell, uh, Ian Ross, uh, yeah, Bruce Richardson, Paul Hamilton. Um, yeah, that's all. Anyway, for the, the, the last event for us, for the racing cars, a day I had a car called the, the Nala, which for those who, who don't know it, that was a, a supercharged whole um, front engine car. Anyway, I drove that and I managed to get in, into the lead. And I thought, fantastic, I'm driving my ring off with this car to to this little did I know that Paul Hamilton had organised everybody else to hold back and then it, as Paul could only do, he managed to block everybody as well. <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole race. And I got in, I thought, wow, have I driven oh, what a race. And little did I know the next twenty cars finished with about half a second on me because they're all banked up you know, behind Paul. So it was a, <laughs> but it was a great gesture and I really appreciated it and it was the last laugh, of course, was on me, but uh, it was great fun. All to the end, I, when um, Brian said, show those photos, I only heard on the, actually on the weekend up at Morgan Park, I met a guy and he said about Amaru, and he said, you know, there's only about six houses or something on the, 
on the whole place. And I said, no, I thought it was going to be a suburban sprawl. And then he showed me not the same photos, not the same photos that Brian had, but uh, I was just amazed. And because, yeah, I thought it was just going to be overrun. So, so that's, that was really my time at Amaru. I was lucky enough to be in the first event and the, and, uh, and the last event. And I, you know, through Paul's conniving, I won at the last. And, through a bit of good fortune, I won at the first, so that was pretty unique. So, okay. Well done. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter, for coming along. We're going to have um, just a little change of laptop here. We might do the raffle in this time if you're already. So, our next speaker is uh, John Lackey from the VSCC of Australia. And John was uh, very instrumental in organising. Uh, the, the early historic race meetings along with, um, oh, he'll tell you the team, Rob Rowe and a few right. others. Welcome to our meeting tonight, John. Can you point out your... Yep. Nice and loud. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nice and loud. Um, I have the, had the privilege of being, I'm not sure it was a privilege now, but... Um, I had the privilege of being the secretary of the meeting for the 1976 through to about um, 80, 89, I think. Uh, Close. Uh, I, I, I finished being secretary of the meeting. Um, I'll talk to you about the very early days. In 1974 or 75, we were getting two races at Warwick Farm. Uh, two races at, at uh, Oran Park. There was nothing concrete for old cars. We'd read about these historic meetings in England and we thought, why can't we do something like that? Now, the mover and shaker for all of this was Robbie Rowe. And uh, before we get into personalities, there's a few people here that, that knew me back in 1974, 75, and they'll tell you when I'm telling fibs. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so um, it started with Robert Rowe and, and, uh, and John Medley, and uh, they thought, how can we get enough fields, um, cars, to make a race meeting? And because Robert Rowe was interested in motorcycles and riding sidecars and those sorts of things, as well as motor cars, he sort of came up with the idea that uh, we should have a meeting for, for two, three and four wheels. So that started people thinking and um, we, uh, I wasn't a member of the, of the team at that stage and uh, Robert um, tried to get the motorcyclists to be involved and they said, no, we don't want to be part of a car race meeting and there was a lot of toing and froing, but in the end we struck up a friendship with a fellow called uh, Peter Jones and, um, and his offsider was at that time was Vic Nicholson and they represented the motorcyclists. Um, Peter Jones was a journalist and uh, he wrote in the motorcycle magazines about historic uh, motorcycles and he was eventually, eventually convinced that we could run a meeting um, with motorcycles and cars. And then, of course, um, they approached John Waring, who was the, um, the manager of, of uh, Amaru. Could we do it? No, there was no way known that you could do it. Um, CAMS wouldn't let motorcycles run at their meetings and, and the ACU wouldn't let cars run at their meetings. So how are we going to do it? So. Uh, Robert and um, Vic Nicholson and Peter Jones went and represented, um, made representations to CAMS and they said, if we do it this way, can we do it? Can we, can we have a combined meeting? And eventually he got CAMS to, on side and uh, the moment CAMS came on side, the ACU decided that, that they should be in it. So um, that was the starting of the, of the uh, the two, three, and four wheel uh, meeting. Now, 
there wasn't enough people. There was John Medley and, and uh, Peter Jones and Vic Nicholson and, and Robert Rowe. How were they going to organise such a big affair? They uh, conned a fellow called Peter Hitchin, which you probably, some of you will know, um, and said to Peter Hitchin, go and find some people that we can put on the, on the uh, committee. And Peter Hitchin said immediately, why isn't John Cummins on this committee? Um, and then a, and a few more people um, were um, brought onto the committee or were asked if they'd be on the committee. And uh, Peter Hitchin said, I know the right man to be the secretary of the meeting. And he conned me into doing it. So um, they'd already started to have meetings at Robert Rowe's house and the meetings went on all night into the early hours of the morning and Robert had young babies, family man um, and so they decided that uh, well perhaps they could have a meeting at my place. Well when it got to be after midnight my wife read the riot act and we were all out in the street <laughs> because I had a young family. Um, and so we ended up at uh, meeting at the ARDC in Leichhardt, in Norton Street, Leichhardt. Now their building there was, was a, a skinny, narrow building, quite deep, but it went up, it was vertically enhanced. <laughs> it went up and up and up, and they decided that we could have the meeting room on the top, very top floor. So the waiter used to struggle up with about 12 or 15 beers on a, on a great big on a great big tray and brought the beers up to the to the meeting and uh, I was never as good a drinker as all those other guys they seemed to be able to drink me under the table pretty quickly so I stayed sober <laughs> and um, managed to write down the various points that were brought up at the meeting and who was responsible and then the next day I'd, I'd type it up and and Ronio it off. Remember, we didn't have computers in those days, so um, everything was a bit. Uh, yeah, we didn't. Have, we we had a very where I worked, we had a very rudimentary um, photocopying machine, um, which sometimes liked me and sometimes hated me. <laughs> anyway, um, what I used to do was write down the point and put a person responsible for fixing it. Uh, alongside it and post it to the to the members of the committee, and somehow or other we got managed to get through um, all the all the jobs and we we had a you know it all went it all worked. The big problems that we had was because we didn't have computers, the the um, supplementary regulations had to be typed and approved, and they come back with with red lines through all sorts of and pencil marks and it had to be totally retyped again because um, we didn't have the, the ability to, to make um, changes and, and, and type you know, uh, like a modern computer, modern PC can. And uh, so it was a big, big thing to get the, the two permits. They arrived about four days before the meeting. In the meantime, Sydney turned on one of its wet um, summers, Jan early January, mid, well, mid-January actually, and um, weren't we delighted when the rain started to clear away on the night before the race meeting? Um, we had uh, a little problem. If we were going to run this meeting, we needed some money. Now, none of us, were, we were pretty, pretty poor because we, uh, we were all um, young fathers and had families and uh, demands on our, our money was uh, pretty high. We were trying to run racing cars as well as bring up families and uh, it just, uh, money wasn't so easy and uh, we sort of worked out that uh, we'd need a lot of money so um, John Medley was uh, given the task of uh, 
of um, finding some money for us. David Medley, his brother, had been co-opted into the committee at that stage, and he was the became the treasurer, and uh, he he was the one that said that. Uh, Correct me, David. You were the one that said that we had to uh, we had to uh, get some money. We 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 did that. Now there were 18 people put up fifty dollars to run this race meeting, and um, I did some sums the other day off the computer, and fifty dollars in 1970. 576 is now about worth about $350. So out of our, our meagre money trying to run a race car and and uh, run a family, we had to find about the equivalent of $350 today. Now, being seniors as we are, $350 doesn't make uh, isn't so great to to us. But if you were to say to my son, find $350, he'd say. Uh, Dad, um, hmm, uh, where do I get $350 from? Anyway, I'm going to read you a little bit. We got the, the $50 came from Ian Cummins, Graham Howard, Peter Hitchin, Mary Hitchin, Dave Robertson, myself, John Medley, Ron Reed, Brian Trinder, Fred Vogel, Hank Northey, Frank Cattell, Cameron McMillan, Russ Johnson, Robert Rowe, Bob Winley, Bruce Pillane and Peter Jones. Um, that um, poster that you can see over there is the, is the first poster that we had. Um, I went to Alan Puckett and I said to Alan, uh, we need a poster for this race meeting. Um, can you do something for us? And, and uh, within two hours, Alan, Produced the master for that uh, for that poster. I then took it to the um, to the printers and said, "Yeah, we want uh, we want a thousand copies." And they said, "Oh, you know, uh, it's going to cost you X, Y, Z. I can't remember the amount of money, but it was way beyond our fifty dollars uh, that we all put in." So uh, we said, "Who do we know? Come out." said, oh, I know, um, uh, what's his name? Anyway, there was a fellow in the, in the Camo New, and Laurie McDonald, and uh, he works for a printer. So we arranged for, to go to Laurie McDonald's place one on, for, for our meeting, and uh, while we were having the meeting, we would print the, print the uh, poster. So, Sometime about 8.30 that night, that's the first poster that came off, off the printer. And, and, and uh, Laurie McDonald gave it to Camo, and Camo gave it to me about three months before he died. Um, and he said, I don't know who to give this to, but look after it for me, please. So that's, that's the, the actual first poster off the, off the printer. Um, Laurie McDonald got his wrists slapped the next morning because there was no red paint left in the in the in the, in the, in the printer, and uh, we were uh, we were admonished over that. A um, uh, couple of weeks later, we uh, printed the supplementary regulations for the bikes and the cars, and. Uh, Laurie McDonald got his wrist slapped over that too because there was no black ink left. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's a bit of the, the, the story there. Um, on the day, um, we, uh, oh, I had to con a few people into doing some things, like my, my, my dear sister is a doctor, and uh, we couldn't find anyone that would uh, do the medical job, so I said to her, um, you better come along to uh, Amaru and, and be the medical person. And she said, uh, she said, can't you get someone else? And I said, no, no, you're, you're it. And uh, anyway, she turned up and did the job. And um, yeah, we had a great day. Um, 
Some of the committee have signed the back, the reverse of that uh, poster, and you can see um, some of the people that were were there. Um, we had a great day, and uh, Frank Cattell was on the committee, and he organised the the uh, after party at the Vicar of Wakefield, and uh, several Perth people did some some uh, grovelling on the grovelling mat and uh, picking up the. Uh, the um, Hank Northey had a had a, a tethered car, and um, to to win the tethered car, you uh, had to pick up a matchbox in your mouth without bending your knees, with the matchbox placed on the floor between your legs, and um, Hank could do it, and and uh, sorry, and uh, a little girl Sue. Mm, Sorry, I don't, can't remember. Gary Dwight. Gary Nelson Dwight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 She she could do it. Um, nobody else nobody else could do it. We 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 got stuck into the into the grog, and um, David Medley was uh, it was the first time that uh, Amaru had made a profit for for a considerable time. And uh, David Medley was uh, over the moon because he had over eight thousand dollars under the seat of his car, which he told everybody where it was <laughs> <laughs> during the process of, of the meeting. So uh, there you are. Um, that's. Uh, and we all got our fifty dollars back. Yeah, that's right. At the end of the day, we all got our fifty dollars back. Um, we went on, and um, we had some more race meetings. I'd like to talk about, um, we, 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 we went away from Amaru because Amaru decided to make it, um, John Waring decided to make it uh, a bit prohibitively expensive so we went to Oran Park and we had a great day at Oran Park. Yeah. Two days worth of beer for the people in the pits. It was the worst drunken evening I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> every, every picture of the place was smashed. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I'd like to tell you a story, a little story about Graham Howard. On that first uh, day, I was in the tower at, at Amaru, and uh, I had this must have had this terribly worried look on my face. And Graham Howard said to me, he said, John, he said, you've wound up a effing big spring and there's nothing you can do. That spring's just going to keep on unwinding all day. And he said, don't worry about it. It's, it's, it'll, it'll happen. And uh, so it did. Um, uh, going to uh, back to Oran Park. I'm sorry I'm a bit disjointed, but... Uh, at, at Oran Park, I, there was one race that I did get to see, and uh, it, I told uh, Peter Moore that I'd tell this story. Um, on the grid was uh, John Dawson Damon in the Lotus 16, and alongside him was David Lowe in the Ned Lowe. And I think it must have been a 10 lap race because. Um, it just seemed a longer race, and I, I don't remember races terribly well. Um, but uh, they set off in the race, and uh, the first lap, Dawson Damer was in the lead coming across the start finish line. By the time they got round to, um, is it, I uh, can't remember, what, what's the, 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 the corner where you go over the hill? Just Dunlop. Um, David Lowe would be in front. And this happened nine laps in a row. And I spoke to David Lowe after the race meeting and he said that bloody Lotus, he said it just had so much urge down the, down the straight, he could out, out, out sprint him to the finish line. And he said I was going to break every bone of that Ned Lowe's body <laughs> to get it over the road, over the, over the line in front of John Dawson Damon. And so he did. Um, 
that's that's a, uh, that's about it. The only other thing we mentioned the meeting that was cancelled um, due to rain. Um, we drove the 1987, I think it was 87 or 88. Um, the rain, the, the the track was so so wet. I drove my I had, I had a little Land Rover at that time, and I drove my Land Rover down into the pits, and the water was over the floorboards in the pits in my Land Rover. So um, we had the you know the, the people lifting their feet off the off the uh, off the floor in the Land Rover. Now I'd just like to read you this little story, and this is the end of me, <laughs> and and I must apologise to the to the Irish. Murphy, Murphy, a furniture dealer from Dublin, decided to expand the line of furniture in his store. So he decided to go to Paris to see what he could find. After arriving in Paris, he visited some manufacturers and selected a line that he thought would sell well back home. To celebrate the new acquisitions, he decided to visit a small bistro and have a glass of wine. As he sat enjoying his wine, he noticed that the small place was quite crowded and that the other chair at his table was the only vacant seat in the house. Before long, a very beautiful young Parisian girl came to his table and asked him something in French, which Murphy couldn't understand. So he motioned to the vacant chair and invited her to sit down. He tried to speak to her in English, but she did not speak his language after a couple of minutes of trying to communicate with her, he took a napkin and drew a picture of a wine glass and showed it to her. She nodded, so he ordered a glass of wine for her. After sitting together at the table for a while, he took another napkin and drew a picture of a plate with food on it, and she nodded. So they both left the bistro. <laughs> and found a quiet cafe that featured small group playing romantic music. They ordered dinner, after which he took another napkin and drew a picture of a couple dancing. She nodded and they got up to dance. They danced until the cafe closed and the band was packing up. Back at the table, the young lady took a napkin and drew a picture of a four-poster bed. To this day, Murphy has no idea how she figured out he was in the furniture business. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Very entertaining. Thank you. Uh, John also has uh, brought along some programs that you might wish to have a look at. They're not, they're not to be taken away, but he uh, is keen for you to have a look at those, should you wish to. Is that that's correct? Yep. They're from Brian Fender. Ah, right. And don't forget to have a look at the... Uh, aforementioned poster that John has there with all the signatures on the back. Well worth having a look at. Um, we will keep moving along there. Uh, a lot of action at Amaru, as most of you know, was motorcycle racing. In fact, the first meeting there was a motorcycle meeting. Uh, a lot of events there. I remember going out on one occasion uh, when John Surtees was racing a Manx Norton. And uh, he was quite entertaining to watch as he kept putting his head under his elbow to see if, if anyone was, you know, catching up with him. No one had a hope in hell of getting anywhere <laughs> near John Surtees out there. And in fact, Peter Addison, who was racing motorbikes out there, said it was one hell of a cheetah motorbike. But uh, I guess everyone was so happy to have John Surtees there, they weren't going to get finicky on eligibility of his hot rod max. Uh, our next speaker, talking about motorcycle side of things, is Chris Mattish, and uh, he's going to talk about some things, uh, tyre testing out there and the six hour. Most of you are, of course, familiar with the name of Mattish. Uh, Chris also did some car racing, didn't you, Chris? A little Formula Ford action? Briefly. 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 Well, you had certainly had a good tutor, I'm sure. Chris, welcome to HSRCA. Thank you.
thank you for inviting me. Firstly, Gary, I must admit, um, when Gary rang me, I thought he had the wrong number because I thought, why would members of the HSRCA be interested in uh, managed memories of motorcycle racing? Uh, but then, of course, as we spoke, um, I guess the, the common thing we all have in, uh, the thing we have all in common, I should say, is, uh, is uh, a, a bit of a love affair with Amaru Park, um, particularly if you came from Sydney and you got to, uh, to go out there quite regularly. Um, I would say I did have a, a love affair with Emory Park. I wish I had a dollar for every hour I'd been there. Um, I had a number of different uh, affairs, I would call it, uh, starting as a 10, 12 year old going out there when Dad would go out for private testing. I think he only ever raced there once, um, and I only know that because I've seen a photograph. I, I don't actually recall it, but uh, I do recall a couple of test days uh, during the week. Um, uh, a few years later, we uh, part of our business was the race tyre distribution, of course, So, uh, and I would always uh, get to go out and work on the tyre trucks, and we'd park the race tyre truck next to the scrutineering bay and between the very fancy toilet block up against the sandstone wall. And uh, I can remember many meetings out there um, you know, working on the tyre truck, um, followed by uh, a, a budding amateur motocross rider over at the motocross track for a few years. That was a... A terrific experience, and uh, and then moving into probably the the um, the bigger association that we had out there was with our motorcycle tyre business um, uh, with Pirelli and uh, the Castrol Six Hour Race, which was a very big uh, event at Amaru Park, um, and it became quite a, a globally recognised event. In fact, um, I noticed I I was going to I thought I'd be able to fill you guys with all kinds of facts and figures, but I see that Will Hagen's here and Peter Malloy's here and luminaries like that, so I'm going to have to cut a lot of things out. Um, I can't embellish the truth at all because those guys will pull me up on it for sure. But uh, so many fun stories out there um, at Amaru, and I did have to do a little bit of research, and I'd like to recommend, if you're interested, a wonderful book written by Jim Scaysbrook. I'm sure there's a, is there a book seller in the room? I imagine there would be. But uh, if you're interested in the history of the Castrol Six Hour Race, um, that's a terrific book, and I had to read that to uh, refresh my memory because this year it's 40 years, <laughs> 1978, when, when uh, we first got involved uh, with Pirelli out there and, and tyre testing. Um, that's the uh, New Zealand Grand Prix, and I kind of hitched a ride after the after Dad won the race. Um, just a, a couple of funny memories, though, at Amaru, and I don't know if, if this means anything to any of you, but during the Castro Six Hour Race, there was a lot of international riders would, would come out, and uh, it had become pretty important by the, the time of the late 70s. And I remember early, the, the, the race would start the week before, and uh, uh, it, you know, scrutinizing would start on the Sunday before the race. The race was always held the second week of October, around about then. And there was this one fellow called Ron Haslam, who was the kind of kingpin in, U in, uh, in the UK, who was an official factory Honda rider. And he came out, and I can remember him going out for the first lap of practice on that Sunday afternoon and uh, coming in white for even a pom, telling us that he'd been attacked by a crocodile at the top of the hill. <laughs> And of course he was referring to the Goannas. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever came across, across Goannas, but um, Ron wasn't the most educated of fellas, but in his view it was a crocodile, and certainly <laughs> that's the story he was telling. And uh, um, often when you go out to Amaru on a private test day, um, the guys, the riders would go out, and no one wanted to go out first because the first guys that would go out would net, you know, always get bombed by the birds at the top of the hill. There's obviously a nest up there, and I don't know if any of you <laughs> ever came across that experience, but um, um, but that would always happen. That you know, it'd take a, a few laps to scare them away, or for them to get used to it, the noise, and the, and they'd leave us alone. But the very first couple of laps, um, there would always be. Uh, a bird attack or something and the guys would tell me that you know we weren't paying them enough and so on and so forth and uh, I think the other one of the other funny stories was um, we were out there on a test day and it had been raining and uh, the track wasn't wet enough to do any wet testing it wasn't dry enough to do any dry testing and we would always hire an ambulance um, for our private test days and um, I was doing a few laps in the car and a couple of other cars were driving around trying to dry it out and we came in and we thought this is really not going anywhere and the ambulance driver asked if, if he could go out and have a wander around. We thought oh well, that's a good idea, it's a big F-150, 250, whatever they were at the time 
And uh, so off they go and up out of the hill and out of sight. And then they come back into view at Mazda House and all we could see is red and white stripes. They came around Mazda House completely sideways. And uh, these poor ambulance guys came in. I thought we'd have to resuscitate them actually. They, they were that white. Um, but uh, it was uh, just one of the, one of the uh, funny memories I've got there. I just, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what order they're in, Dave, but whatever you like. So, um, I think that one before was one of those private test days with the McLaren. Um, that, uh, Peter Maybe? Yeah, Peter Maybe, and I think Lugsy, Graham <laughs> Adams. Um, that looks like the M10B, early days, before it went to the 13 inch front wheels. Do you want me to go through the photos? If you like, yeah, if it, I think just a bit of history. When, when Dad retired from racing, um, we were moving away from the automotive or the car side of things and getting more heavily involved in motorcycles. Uh, as an industry at least, uh, we started importing bell helmets and um, uh, the market for motorcycle helmets was expanding and uh, uh, this was uh, the team of guys that did a lot of the tyre testing for us in the early days. Alan Hales on the left, Neil Chivers, son of Doug, um, in the centre and David Hiscock on the right. They were the official Suzuki team in 1980. Um, Alan Hales was, um, was instrumental um, working with us uh, in developing the very first Pirelli Phantoms uh, and uh, won the race in 1979. Um, Jeff French, son of um, John, also rode for us. Uh, throughout the year we had many, many different riders. Um, we usually ran a two or three bike team and um, uh, fortunate enough to, to work with people like um, Wayne Gardner and um, Jeff French, Lenny Willing, uh, Richard Scott, Rod Cox, just um, you know, many, many guys and uh, all the best guys of the time. So it was a, a terrific experience. This was Lenny Willing, Warren's younger brother on the left and Vince Sharp in 1983, I think that would have been. So very quickly, John Carlo Armelin on the right and Dad. Um, Johnny was the, uh, the chief engineer for Pirelli at the time. Uh, they sent us out some tyres in 1978, so uh, 40 years ago uh, this year, um, to test. And in, back in the mid-70s, Pirelli was very much an Italian company, obviously, but only sold pretty much in Europe. And they developed their tyres with the local Italian manufacturers, so Motor Guzzi, La Verda, uh, Ducati, uh, people like that. So twin cylinder, lightweight, nice handling, low horsepower vehicles and uh, they wanted to crack into the global market, which was being dominated by the Japanese. Four cylinders, heavy, not terribly well handling, and so on. So they developed a new product called the Pirelli Phantom. Uh, they sent it, uh, some tyres out for us, and uh, only a small quantity, and we were out at Amory Park for the Castrol Six Hour Race in 78, and uh, uh, the race by this stage started in 1970, and it had really become quite a significant event in the calendar. It was recognised around the world by the industry, motorcycles, tyre companies, uh, as having um, as been a, a hell of a test of endurance and, and performance overall. And it was certainly, uh, in that period of time, motorcycles were evolving very rapidly every year. Um, you know, every year through the 70s and the 80s, the, the bikes were changing dramatically, wheel sizes, uh, technology, suspension, and, uh, uh, and of course the six hour race became one of these events that could really showcase you know, which was the best product at the time. And it was one of those classic examples of race on Sunday and sell on Monday. Um, you, know, it, you know, if you had a bike that, uh, that worked well at the Castrol Six Hour Race, it demonstrated to the public that you had a good handling, fast, reliable, economical bike, which is exactly what the road rider needed. And, and from the same point of view with the tyres, um, if you could uh, handle around a tight twisty circuit like Amaru Park, which was very abrasive, um, you had a tyre that would be, perform as well as, as last a long time. So uh, the initial testing highlighted to us that the, the product was, uh, was particularly good in the wet, but it wouldn't have lasted an hour, let alone six hours. And in those days, in the, by this time, the mid to late 70s, um, a winning, um, uh, you know, to win the race, you had to have a tyre that would last six hours. There was no thought of changing tyres or anything like that. So I um, just want to quickly diverse. This is 1981 when uh, uh, early in the year Suzuki decided it was going to withdraw from supporting their riders and uh, they, they weren't happy with having individual riders running their own show and uh, 
we were about to lose our testing facility or our, our riders, so we were more or less forced into becoming a, uh, a, a, a race team as well. We'd been a testing team for a period of years, but um, uh, so in 81 we formed our own team and, and, uh, and started racing and, and I thought just might be interested to know we got a, a phone call. Peter Malloy might be able to remember exactly when, but it was um, Peter ringing to say that uh, he had a commitment, a sponsor, and a commitment to race at the Castrol Six Hour Race. And he had a rider, young and up and coming guy called Wayne Gardner, uh, who was coming back from England, but he didn't have any bikes, and he didn't have any crew, and he didn't have any fuel changing equipment, or tyre changing equipment, or fuel drums, or anything. So he wanted to see if we could do a deal with us to run a bike for him. And uh, I think, um, as I recall it, Peter, we, we kind of had a chat for about half an hour and said, um, well, why don't we paint all our bikes Western Underwriters and the guys can be in Pirelli leathers and away we go. We'll run as one big happy family, and which we did. So that's how we started. Uh, that was our first year at the Castrol Six Hour Race. And um, we ran two GSX 1100s in the open class and one 750. And five hours and 54 minutes into the race, we were running first and second. Um, outright and second in the 750 class, um, Wayne Gardner was, we had uh, one bike was in the lead and the second bike ridden by Wayne was uh, was trying to make up for a deficit, uh, it had been a wet race all day and um, he was miles behind really, no hope of really catching the lead, the lead bike and I'm saying to Peter, slow him down Peter, slow him down, Peter's going yeah slow down, but I'm sure he's winking at him at the same time, like not to slow down. <laughs> Um, but with about three or four minutes to go, um, uh, Wayne, unfortunately, I think when he did actually back off, he probably lost a little bit of concentration, as, as he said, and, uh, and put the bike down the road. So we went from having a 1-2 in our first year to a win anyway. But uh, it was uh, just an interesting connection with, uh, with Peter, from, uh, who'd been a major competitor of Dad's for many, many years. And uh, uh, we all got on terrifically well and, uh, and had a lot of success that year. So, um, so we... we and fortunately uh, for us, Pirelli were very interested to try and crack into this global market. The Castrol Six Hour Race was a, it was a marketing opportunity, but also when we provided them a very thorough testing report of the initial tyres, that impressed the engineers with the detail. And we went over there with tyres, and they'd never seen tyres worn as aggressively as, as these tyres. They just couldn't believe how hard the Australian and New Zealand riders actually rode a production bike. And um, so we started a very intense program and it, and it evolved and evolved to the point that I would often be at Amaru Park at least once a week, uh, sometimes twice, uh, for a period of months in, in the early part of the year. Um, I can remember on a number of occasions getting a phone call from Frank Gardner saying, hey Chris, uh, I was talking to the ARDC, they said you've got the circuit book next Tuesday, any chance we could get on for an hour at lunchtime? Uh, which we did a number of times and then we, he would reciprocate and <laughs> he would have the, the circuit booked uh, in the JPS BMW days and, uh, and he'd let us uh, come out there and do a run around at lunchtime. And, uh, so we, we just basically lived out there doing basically all of Pirelli's high performance outdoor tyre testing and for us it was an opportunity of de developing a, um, the best product which in turn allowed us to be successful in the market. Um, this was back in the days pre, pre tyre changing machines and <laughs> we would literally be bent over like that for a week, uh, changing hundreds of tyres. Our, our whole strategy really was to have the best product and have the, the highest percentage of the field using the tyres. So, and that's how we advertised, it was 44% you know, of the field chose Pirelli. So who were the best riders of the time on any brand were using our product. And if we were lucky enough to win, well that was a bonus. And uh, so it was all about developing the best product and the deal we had with, with Pirelli was that if we came up with substantial improvements, they would put that into production and uh, hence we would have tyres uh, and get the best product and, and be more successful in the market, which, which we were. But um, yeah, Amaru, just, just to, to finish up, was, uh, was a really awesome track to, to, to test tyres at, for motorcycles particularly. Um, and I just you know, wanted to share with you some of the reasons why, but I mean, firstly, 
the place had this rhythm that, and I saw a lot of hands go up earlier of people that had driven there, and, and so you all know that what I mean when I say a rhythm, but it made it very easy to be consistent and uh, as a rider, and uh, and if you can be consistent, you'll get very accurate results as, in terms of tyre testing. So, so we had a, a circuit with a great rhythm, um, a very abrasive circuit, uh, so and obviously a lot of right-hand corners. So in 60 laps, we could you know come up with a very accurate tread wear. Um, as opposed to a circuit with left and right, it could take you an awful lot longer. Um, the, uh, the layout of the circuit had everything, as we know, the heavy braking for stability. It was a very much a, a circuit that you needed a, a very good front tyre for, and uh, a front tyre is a very important thing to a motorcycle rider, a uh, racer particularly, uh, in terms of giving them the confidence. Uh, you had the, uh, the heavy acceleration out of Honda and Stop Corner, you had the rough surface going along there before Ron Hodgson, you know, so that helped with carcass development. Uh, Neil Chivers here uh, being featured there, who was a, also had a tyre business and very successful. Um, uh, yeah, so you had the high speed corners through the straight and over the top of the hill. Uh, just had everything in this 58, 55 second lap and, um, uh, and with an abrasive circuit. So, and of course you go out there with a guy that would get used to the rhythm and a lot of guys didn't like Amory Park, they couldn't get used to the danger that surrounded it but once you uh, you got comfortable with the place, um, you know, it, it was it was a pretty safe track and I used to really enjoy going out there because the ARDC every time you arrived there'd be something improved, you know, there'd be a tie wall moved back, there'd be some improvement in the facility somewhere um, and uh, as I said I, I, can't, I would have just done hundreds of, of days out there over, over 10 years um, you know, uh, as we as we develop these tyres and you know, very successfully, so it was um, a, t a terrific uh, period uh, for us as a as a business. And um, what about you as a driver? Yeah, you know, I had a uh, that was the last little foray I had at Amaru Park a couple of years after we there was a change of management at Pirelli, and the new manager came in and said, "Why is this customer doing all this testing, and why are we air freighting all these tyres to the other side of the world?" So, um, so he pretty much stopped that in, in uh, 1986, and uh, uh, we kind of lost a little bit of interest uh, because we were, you know, Dad was just a, uh, you know, he just loved developing things. <laughs> that was that was his thing, and if we weren't developing, he kind of lost interest and went into something else. So, um, I was over in Italy in 1987 um, on on a business trip, and uh, I remember ringing home and uh, saying to Dad, "Oh, yeah, the meeting had gone well, blah blah blah." And he said, "Oh, so are you on the flight this afternoon?" Or and I said, "Actually, I'm going to England for the weekend. Um, I'm going to look at buying a Formula Ford." And that's how actually, actually I broke the news to him. So, um, but uh, there was a RF86 that I ended up racing in um, in 1988, and with the help of Wally Story to uh, to help me set it up, um, we ended up having a a, a brief brief period in Formula Ford, which was uh, a niche I needed to scratch, and I uh, was able to have the lap record there for a couple of years, but um, um, this just shows, that I guess, the output of the success of, uh, um, and how we marketed Pirelli, but it all it was all very much around being able to develop the product uh, at Amaru Park and, and use that, un, you know, the very unique nature of the circuit um, to get, you know, very good results, accurate results, and uh, um, and improve the product. So, uh, uh, and as I was at, even when the race moved from Amaru Park um, to Oran Park in 1984, we continued to do all the testing at Amaru Park because, again, we just got the such a, a you know an accurate result there and uh, and improved the product. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. That's all very fascinating stuff. I guess for a lot of us tend to forget that uh, there was a lot, lot more happening out there than just uh, our historic racing that we were mostly interested in. The other good thing about Amaru that I quite enjoyed was that on a Friday you could go out there and go test or drive around for the day for, I don't know, $60, $70. It was quite a good uh, arrangement. Beats the hell out of driving all the way down to Wakefield Park and all the way back mm. in the day for testing. It was great like that. Our next speaker, uh, Ray Berghaus, is going to talk on some of the other events that happened out at Amaru, other series uh, that were held there. Um, 
Ray's going to fill us in on a few of those and up until the final days. So a big welcome please for Ray Berghaus. Good evening. Uh, I was thinking earlier about the right way to start this conversation. Uh, let's just call this a very interesting room of grey. <laughs> I think, I think grey is the overall topic or the overall <laughs> colour. Um, uh, I guess from my point of view when I was asked to, to come in and share a few memories, uh, it's all based around the fact that I viewed the whole exercise, all of the years of Amory Park from a very different perspective to probably everybody else in this room with the possible exception of Will Hagen. Um, I started off as a, as a car club racer. I, I can remember going up the hill climb in a Volkswagen in 1962, which probably predates most of you guys going out there, uh, running at the, at the dirt short circuit in 63, 64. Um, we had a, a lot of fun out there long before the main circuit started. And what I did for this to show you a, a little bit about the history of what happened, at, if you would call it more the professional end of the game, um, you look at some of these photographs, and there's Graham Moore in a typical early 1970s approach to Amaru Park driving. Um, when you look at, I went through a whole ream of photographs at the office, uh, and we've got something, something in the region of 750,000 colour transparencies on file at the work, and well over a million prints, and, and we, I just wanted to take about 30 or 40 of them out, I didn't want to bring the entire thing with me. Uh, but you will see as we wander through these photographs, you'll see that Amaru Park was one of the circuits, probably the only circuit, that enabled series production cars to be driven by really competent drivers at the most ridiculous angles of attack. Now, that's going into uh, effectively what became Honda Corner, the, probably the only left-hand corner on the entire circuit, the only proper left-hand corner. But Unfortunately, I couldn't find at the time when I was looking for these pictures, but we have photographs taken, and you've got to remember that I was a photographer all through this era, once I gave up trying to actually be a racing car driver. Um, and standing at certain places at Amberu Park, you were able to see people uh, driving motor cars at a, a level that you just don't often see. Now, remember the last corner onto the straight. Now, when you came into that last corner, a lot of us used to shoot back on, so you would actually be in front of the last corner, looking at the last corner across the apex from behind. And you would see photographs of XU1s and Falcon GDHOs, John Goss in particular, literally with no more left lock on. There was no more left lock to be put on, and the car was at about that angle to the, to the corner. And they would go around that corner and brush against the fence literally every time. And you would just wonder, if anybody made that one poofteenth of a mistake, there would be the world's biggest accident because <laughs> that guy would go backwards and you would end up in a disaster. Now, here we go. This is the, the top of the hill coming down from the, what is effectively the you know, over the top and that continuous right-hand corner that never seemed to end. <laughs> and uh, again, Graham and Donnie, is that you? Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, this is an era when cars were able to run side by side. Now, you hardly ever see that today. It's only very rarely that you see two guys going around a corner together. And that's generally when a faster guy is passing a slower guy. But in this era, and if you <laughs> now that's got to be Freddie Gibson, I reckon. And that's Colin, right? This would be 71, a rough guess. Um, as uh, certainly, thank you, Don. Now you you can you can see. Remember that 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 sort of earth wall around the t that first corner at the top of the hill. Okay, talk about safety measures. I mean, that was kind of like a vertical sand trap, because if you hit it, you didn't go very much further. <laughs> and generally, you hit it with the rear left-hand corner of the car which meant that the front left-hand front left -hand corner of the car was going to follow very smartly thereafter. Mm. And that's pretty much where you stopped. Uh, there's Fred. Now, 
Well, I couldn't find it, but there's a photograph in the files. It wasn't taken by myself. It was taken by Rod McKenzie of Bob Morris coming around that corner. You've all seen it, that photograph in the XU1, with his up on two wheels, he's at about a 45 degree angle. How he did not fall over, I will never know. And it was Leo Gagan in the Charger, and I think Fred Gibson in the Falcon, more or less on either side of him. Now, again, these are photographs that you will never see anywhere else. They, this sort of action didn't happen that often. The only corner at Oran Park that you ever saw anything like that happening was the last corner onto the straight. But at Amaru, you had literally three corners. You had the last corner, the first set of corners, and Honda. Actually make it four corners because this is the last corner. And again, Stop. there's Don, there's Leo, there's Fred. <laughs> I mean, you can't get much closer than that and not actually change paint. And being a photographer, that was just so much fun. Now, we're moving into a different era. That's Evan Green. In the era when the Southern Cross Rally used to start at Amory Park, and there were some absolutely spectacular uh, drivers on that short circuit. They used to use the short circuit. Sometimes they used the hill climb as well, but not often. And we don't have photographs of them. There's some other photographs as you'll come through here of other guys, Ron Marks in the Stratos. Um, now we're getting a little later. That's Ronnie. That's uh, that's Dunkerton in the Datsun. But before the, the, the rally started, quite often they would have a media day out there. And I can remember being in one of Colin Bond's uh, RS escorts, being driven by Ari Vattenham. And he was, we, they were doing laps, they're taking the journos around for laps. And I kid, kid you not, have you ever, anybody here driven on the short circuit there? On the dirt circuit? Well, you might remember that coming down the back straight, you came sort of down the hill, Big, big, looping downhill left-hand corner, up the other side. Ari in the left-hand drive car would be at about 45 degrees and talking to you as he was driving, because he was talking to you, he wasn't looking where he was going. <laughs> because he didn't care. I mean, you know, the road was there, the car would follow the road. And when you see these guys, it, this is one of the very early special stages where the public were allowed to come out and see them in daylight. Because if you'd remember in those days, the Southern Cross, like most rallies, were primarily at night. And, you know, to watch these guys running around there, it's only a short circuit, but, you know, you, you've got sort of 40 seconds worth of real excitement. Now, we're switching back to the circuit again. I think we all know who that is, yes? Exactly. Um, there's another photograph just a little bit later on from this same day. Now this photograph, if it would stop here for a second, there's a story behind this. This is 1980. Now this I think from memory was a better brakes race. And this was the day that Peter Brock crashed. Now where he crashed was coming into the pits. If you remember you came down that last bit of straight and you went straight ahead instead of turning right. Now, as Peter came into the pits that afternoon, going a little bit too fast, I might add, Sharon McKay, who ran the media centre, which is that building you can see in the background, Sharon had been having problems with the plumbing in the, in the sink. And a, few, a moment or two before Peter arrived into the pit lane, the, there was a whole dump of water that came out of the media centre's sink and it covered the entry road and it had a lot of, there was a fair bit of soap involved <laughs> and Brock hit this water, went straight into the wall, instantly claimed that that was why he crashed. The mere fact that he was going at least twice as fast as he should have been was incidental and this, this was actually, this, was take, this picture was taken before that happened but it was really quite interesting because it was another example of a professional racing driver finding any reason why it wasn't his fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, this, there's a few start shots here, and when you look at something like that, you see you know, Jimmy Richards, Alan Moffat, you know, Phil Ward, you know, Edmondson. There's some really heavy-duty guys there. And when you think that effectively Amaru Park was a club circuit, some really heavy-duty guys ran at that circuit many, many times. 
both touring cars, sports cars, sports sedans, open wheelers. Does anybody remember the demonstration race for Formula 5000s? There you go. I thought that was the funniest race of all time because they had about 10 Formula 5000 cars and because, because they were so fast, they had to actually decide who was going to pass who, where, in order to make it look exciting. And so at the top of the hill, you know, somebody would come over, he'd be Gossy, he'd be in front and Max would be behind him and then John would move one car left to the legs width to the left and there'd be a finger go out the side like that and Max would go down the inside and round they go. And this went on for about 10 laps and there were people passing each other in the most ridiculous places. It, it, it was one of those things that I think the entire Amaru Park audience was enthralled by something that was the biggest con art I've, I've seen in years. But when you look at that, you look at, at all of those cars, and if you can flick onto some of the other start shots, oh, that's, well, again, moving into the same era. You know, we're talking early 90s, right? 90s? That's right. Uh, 80s, what am I saying? Now, that's an interesting start shot, isn't it? John Bow, you know. There's, again, cars that you would not expect to see at a tiny little circuit like Amory Park. I mean, these, these are sort of almost Le Mans-style cars. You know? And when you think that these are, you know, 500 horsepower monsters, they must have been quite challenging on that tight little circuit. You know? And again, you had very, very competent people doing it. And I guess from my point of view, I was really lucky for all of those years to be able to... A, a, a motor racing photographer has one thing, one wonderful thing that most people don't have. I've got the best seat in the house and I can move it anywhere I want to take it. And so I can move corners and take different things, look different angles, see people working in, in different ways in different places. And again, you see all this, the, the rebirth of Appendix J. We all remember that era, right? There were some wonderful races at Amaru, and look at the look at the variety of cars on that grid. I mean, truly, everything from E. H. Holdens and Mustangs to an, an Aust what is that in the background? Is that it's a, it's a Morris Major? Is it? God. Yeah. Not exactly my choice for a racing car, but you know that that's why I think a lot of ways Amaru was. We, was so liked by so many people because it was a circuit that everybody could have fun at. Uh, well, I, 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 that was a nice way of introducing the next photograph. Wasn't it? <laughs> now, but if you can, if you can, if you can cast your eyes past women, look at the hillside. Look at the crowd on that hill. Now, how many times have we literally been to Amaru Park where they more or less closed the gates because there was yeah. nowhere else to park the car? Yeah, yeah. And there was nowhere else to stand. Yeah. And that's an era, that's early 90s, in an era when motor racing, I think, was in one of its golden eras. You know, uh, we might be told now that we are living in a golden era of motor racing, but they don't get crowds like that. No. Not very often. Now there's a the, the, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes yes Alan Jones John John Bow Dicky Johnson yeah. uh, yes there's an awful lot of horsepower and not too much in the way of width of rubber <laughs> and you know races like that you know they they were fantastic touring car championship races do we all remember the first race of the new series which was in 1990. I'm just trying to get the head, get, get my head around the right year. It was the year that they decided to change classes, and they they introduced the five litre class and the two litre class. Hmm. And the two litre classes cars were supposed to be 300 horsepower, and the five litre cars were supposed to be 400 horsepower, and they were all going to race together. And we had the first round of the championship at Amory Park, and the five litre cars lapped the two litre cars in about five. It was just, it was a complete schmozzle. Uh, this is a bit later on than that, but that was, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. That's earlier than, than what I'm talking about because we're talking about the, the early part of the era where Falcon and Commodore became the dominant cars. And 
uh, in that era, we saw some, you know, we saw again some fantastic races at Amaru Park. That first, I think it was the first or the second race of the championship in one of those two years, um, I don't think that there was a, a straight Commodore or Falcon nose at the end of the weekend because everybody kept dragging the, the scoops off the front of them. Uh, but look at the pit area. Look at how many people are crammed into that tiny little space. You know, you just don't see that anymore, almost anywhere. And now we're into the era of the Godzilla. Now, it was interesting earlier, um, one, of the, one of our previous speakers uh, mentioned uh, Wally's story. Um, when Frank, but sorry, when um, Freddie Gibson decided to run the Godzillas, um, and he brought the first road car out a couple of years earlier than this, and we were told that it had twin turbos, uh, four-wheel steer, four-wheel drive. Um, Wally wasn't impressed by that because Wally was running the Holden dealer team at the time, the Holden racing team. Um, he said that he thought that it was unfair that the GTR would have so many advantages. Uh, he said, I don't think Fred's going to run the four-wheel steering anyway because it's too, too damn complicated. He said, the turbos we can't do too much about. <laughs> he said, but the four-wheel drive, I think, that's wrong. He said, there's no way in the world that they should be allowed to run four-wheel drive. He said, they should be two-wheel drive. I suggest front left and rear right. <laughs> he said, let's see him make the damn thing handle then. <laughs> same day, same idea. Uh, and there's a little funny story. In this era, I was responsible for selling advertising at this joint, as in, as in you know, circuit advertising. And you'll notice that the paint scheme on the wall matched one of the team cars. And when I went to Ivan and said, Peter Jackson want a really big sign. And he said, how big? And I said, oh, around about 150 metres long. And he said, where are you going to put that? I said, it's already there. <laughs> and we painted that section of Armco. And it was one of those exercises because at that time, very early in the days when the government was trying to ban cigarette advertising, which they eventually, of course, did, um, Channel 7 were under a lot of stress not to show cigarette advertising on the cars or on, the, or on advertising posters around the circuit. And so because that was painted in the same colours as, uh, as Glenn's cars, they couldn't escape it. It was one of those sort of subliminal advertising tricks that we got away with for a little while. Now that, that's going back earlier, that's Graham. Gee, you've turned up a lot here tonight, haven't you? You know, that's, that, is that you again? Of course it is. Yeah, and you'll notice how agricultural the, uh, the side of the racetrack is. But again, look at all the people at the top of that hill. You know, it's, it's quite amazing how many people were there. Now, um, the other thing I suppose I, I, I wanted to talk about tonight, just for the pure fun of it, and there's a good shot, is the accidents. We had some spectacular accidents at Amory Park <laughs> over the years, some absolute doozies. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is, is, that's, I assume you're going to claim talent there, okay? Yes? <laughs> um, the, one of the historic meetings, and I can't remember which one it was, but Laurie O'Neill brought out one of his GT40s. Right? Do we all remember that day? Yeah. And do we remember what happened to the GT40? Yeah. That was an expensive afternoon, wasn't it? It's just so it shows what happens when you put too much tyre pressure, tyre pressure into tyres that have been sitting on a stationary motor car for about five years. That was not a good day. But um, looking at all these things, you know, the Sun 7 series for the three litre cars that became the three and a half litre cars when we had a BMW to run. Um, all of those, that era, just had so many different things running for it. They were just wonderful motor races, and every race on the car, every race on the day, would have somebody in it that was worthwhile watching, if not a whole lot of somebodies. And you know, from the point of view of a motor racing photographer and a publisher, 
I got so much joy out of that place. And I think that we all did too. Now, I mean, you don't see that often. You really don't. That, that's sort of almost memories of Catalina Park, isn't it? I can't remember what year that is, but it's obviously a mixture of sports sedans and series production car or, you know, Appendix J cars. But that's another era, you know, the three and a half litre cars. So I think that I, like all of you, uh, we all lived through a time that we can be very happy about because it was a wonderful place to be. Not when you live. That wasn't you, was it, Don? No. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Uh, you know, when you think about it, it was agricultural, but it was agricultural of its type at the time. We didn't think of it as being dangerous. It was just what it was. Right? In the same way that Bathurst was what it was before they built concrete walls all the way around it. So really, we are all very, I think, blessed with having the opportunity to be there through all of those, well, those several decades and enjoy motor racing in a really sort of close-up, fun fashion. And I'm, I, for one, I'm very pleased I was there. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Well, that's almost our evening wrapped up. I'd like to give, uh, like to get you to give a warm round of applause to all our speakers again. If you want, it's been wonderful. Also to uh, resident roadie Dave Williamson for his help. Where's Dayton for getting a lot of this stuff together, along with Brian Caldersmith and John Stokes here doing the visuals. We really appreciate all your work. Hope you've had a good night. Don't forget to look at the books, the programs over here, and that original poster. Don't walk away with any of that, though. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Well done.